the sinking of the Titanic seen from a lifeboat. Looking back now on the descent of our boat down the ship's side, it is a matter of surprise, I think, to all the occupants to remember how little they thought of it at the time. It was a great adventure, certainly. It was exciting to feel the boat sink by jerks, foot by foot, as the ropes were paid out from above and shrieked as they passed through the pulley blocks, the new ropes and gear creaking under the strain of a boat laden with people, and the crew calling to the sailors above as the boat tilted slightly, now at one end, now at the other. Lower aft, lower stern, and lower together as she came level again, but I do not think we felt much apprehension about reaching the water safely. It certainly was thrilling to see the black hull of the ship on one side, and the sea, seventy feet below, on the other, or to pass down by cabins and saloons brilliantly lighted. But we knew nothing of the apprehension felt in the minds of some of the officers whether the boats and lowering gear would stand the strain of the weight of our sixty people. The ropes, however, were new and strong, and the boat did not buckle in the middle as an older boat might have done. Whether it was right or not to lower the boats full of people to the water, and it seems likely it was not, I think there can be nothing but the highest praise given to the officers and crew above for the way in which they lowered the boats, one after the other, safely to the water. It may seem a simple matter to read about such a thing, but any sailor knows, apparently, that it is not so. An experienced officer has told me that he has seen a boat lowered in practice from a ship's deck with a trained crew and no passengers in the boat, with practiced sailors paying out the ropes in daylight, in calm weather, with the ship lying in dock, and has seen the boat tilt over and pitch the crew headlong into the sea. Contrast these conditions with those obtaining that Monday morning at 12.45 a.m., and it is impossible not to feel that, whether the lowering crew were trained or not, whether they had or had not drilled since coming on board, that they did their duty in a way that argues the greatest efficiency. I cannot help feeling the deepest gratitude to the two sailors who stood at the ropes above and lowered us to the sea. I do not suppose they were saved. Perhaps one explanation of our feeling little sense of the unusual in leaving the Titanic in this way was that it seemed the climax to a series of extraordinary occurrences. The magnitude of the whole thing dwarfed events that in the ordinary way would seem to be full of imminent peril. It is easy to imagine it, a voyage of four days on a calm sea without a single untoward incident. The presumption, perhaps already mentally half realized, that we should be ashore in forty-eight hours, and so complete a splendid voyage, and then to feel the engine stop, to be summoned on deck with little time to dress, to tie on a life-belt, to see rockets shooting aloft and call for help, to be told to get into a lifeboat. After all these things, it did not seem much to feel the boat sinking down to the sea. It was the natural sequence of previous events, and we had learned in the last hour to take things just as they came. At the same time, if any one should wonder what the sensation is like, it is quite easy to measure seventy-five feet from the windows of a tall house or a block of flats, look down to the ground, and fancy himself with some sixty other people crowded into a boat so tightly that he could not sit down or move about, and then picture the boat sinking down in a continuous series of jerks, as the sailors pay out the ropes through cleats above. There are more pleasant sensations than this. How thankful we were that the sea was calm, and the Titanic lay so steadily and quietly as we dropped down her side. We were spared the bumping and grinding against the side which so often accompanies the launching of boats. I do not remember that we even had to fend off our boat while we were trying to get free. As we went down, one of the crew shouted, We are just over the condenser exhaust. We don't want to stay in that long or we shall be swamped. Feel down on the floor and be ready to pull up the pin which lets the ropes free as soon as we are afloat. 
I had often looked over the side and noticed this stream of water coming out of the side of the Titanic, just above the water line. In fact, so large was the volume of water that, as we plowed along and met the waves coming towards us, this stream would cause a splash that sent spray flying. We felt, as well as we could in the crowd of people on the floor, along the sides, with no idea where the pen could be found, and none of the crew knew where it was, only of its existence somewhere, but we never found it. And all the time we got closer to the sea, and the exhaust roared nearer and nearer, until finally we floated with the ropes still holding us from above, the exhaust washing us away, and the force of the tide driving us back against the side, the latter not of much account in influencing the direction, however. Thinking over what followed, I imagine we must have touched the water with the condenser stream at our bows, and not in the middle as I thought at one time. At any rate, the resultant of these three forces was that we were carried parallel to the ship, directly under the place where boat 15 would drop from her davits into the sea. Looking up, we saw her already coming down rapidly from B-deck. She must have filled almost immediately after ours. We shouted up, Stop lowering 14! Footnote. In an account which appeared in the newspapers of April 19, I have described this boat as 14, not knowing they were numbered alternately. And the crew and passengers in the boat above, hearing us shout and seeing our position immediately below them, shouted the same to the sailors on the boat deck. But apparently they did not hear, for she dropped down foot by foot, twenty feet, fifteen, ten, and a stoker and I in the bows reached up and touched her bottom, swinging above our heads, trying to push away from our boat from under her. It seemed now as if nothing could prevent her dropping on us, but at this moment another stoker sprang with his knife to the ropes that still held us, and I heard him shout, One! Two! as he cut them through. The next moment we had swung away from underneath fifteen, and were clear of her as she dropped into the water, in the space we had just before occupied. I do not know how the bell ropes were freed, but imagine that they were cut in the same way, for we were washed clear of the Titanic at once by the force of the stream, and floated away as the oars were got out. I think we all felt that that was quite the most exciting thing we had yet been through, and a great sigh of relief and gratitude went up as we swung away from the boat above our heads. But I heard no one cry aloud during the experience. Not a woman's voice was raised in fear or hysteria. I think we all learnt many things that night about the bogey called fear, and how the facing of it is much less than the dread of it. The crew was made up of cooks and stewards, mostly the former, I think their white jackets showing up in the darkness as they pulled away, two to an oar. I do not think they can have had any practice in rowing, for all night long their oars crossed and clashed. If our safety had depended on speed or accuracy in keeping time, it would have gone hard with us. Shouting began from one end of the boat to the other, as to what we should do, where we should go, and no one seemed to have any knowledge how to act. At last we asked, who is in charge of this boat? But there was no reply. We then agreed by general consent that the stoker, who stood in the stern with the tiller, should act as captain. And from that time he directed the course, shouting to other boats and keeping in touch with them. Not that there was anywhere to go or anything we could do. Our plan of action was simple, to keep all the boats together as far as possible, and wait until we were picked up by other liners. The crew had apparently heard of the wireless communications before they left the Titanic, but I never heard them say that we were in touch with any boat but the Olympic. It was always the Olympic that was coming to our rescue. They thought they knew even her distance, and making a calculation, we came to the conclusion that we ought to be picked up by her about two o'clock in the afternoon, but this was not our only hope of rescue. We watched all the time the darkness lasted for steamers' lights, thinking there might be a chance of other steamers coming near enough to see the lights which some of our boats carried. 
I am sure there was no feeling in the minds of any one that we should not be picked up next day. We knew that wireless messages would go out from ship to ship, and as one of the stokers said, The sea will be covered with ships tomorrow afternoon. They will race up from all over the sea to find us. Some even thought that fast torpedo boats might run up ahead of the Olympic, and yet the Olympic was, after all, the farthest away of them all. Eight other ships lay within three hundred miles of us. How thankful we should have been to know how near help was, and how many ships had heard our message and were rushing to the Titanic's aid. I think nothing has surprised us more than to learn so many ships were near enough to rescue us in a few hours. Almost immediately after leaving the Titanic, we saw what we all said was a ship's lights down on the horizon on the Titanic's port side. Two lights, one above the other, and plainly not one of our boats. We even rowed in that direction for some time, but the lights drew away and disappeared below the horizon. But this is rather anticipating. We did none of these things first. We had no eyes for anything but the ship we had just left. As the oarsmen pulled slowly away, we all turned and took a long look at the mighty vessel towering high above our midget boat, and I know it must have been the most extraordinary sight I shall ever be called upon to witness. I realize now how totally inadequate language is to convey to some other person who was not there any real impression of what we saw. But the task must be attempted. The whole picture is so intensely dramatic that, while it is not possible to place on paper for eyes to see the actual likeness of the ship as she lay there, some sketch of the scene will be possible. First of all, the climatic conditions were extraordinary. The night was one of the most beautiful I have ever seen. The sky, without a single cloud to mar, the perfect brilliance of the stars, clustered so thickly together that in places there seemed almost more dazzling points of light set in the black sky than background of sky itself. And each star seemed, in the keen atmosphere, free from any haze, to have increased its brilliance tenfold, and to twinkle and glitter with a staccato flash that made the sky seem nothing but a setting made for them in which to display their wonder. They seemed so near, and their light so much more intense than ever before, that fancy suggested they saw this beautiful ship in dire distress below, and all their energies had awakened to flash messages across the black dome of the sky to each other, telling and warning of the calamity happening in the world beneath. Later, when the Titanic had gone down, and we lay still on the sea, waiting for the day to dawn, or a ship to come, I remember looking up at the perfect sky and realizing why Shakespeare wrote the beautiful words he puts in the mouth of Lorenzo. Jessica, look how the floor of heaven is thick and laid with patines of bright gold. There's not the smallest orb which thou beholdest, but in his motion like an angel sings, still choiring to the young-eyed cherubims. Such harmony is in immortal souls, but whilst this muddy vesture of decay doth grossly close it in, we cannot hear it. But it seemed almost as if we could, that night. The stars seemed really to be alive and to talk. The complete absence of haze produced a phenomenon I had never seen before. Where the sky met the sea, the line was as clear and definite as the edge of a knife, so that the water and the air never merged gradually into each other, and blended to a softened, rounded horizon. But each element was so exclusively separate, that where a star came low down into the sky, near the clear-cut edge of the water line, it still lost none of its brilliance. As the earth revolved, and the water edge came up, and covered partially the star, as it were, it simply cut the star in two, the upper half continuing to sparkle as long as it was not entirely hidden, and throwing a long beam of light along the sea to us. In the evidence before the United States Senate Committee, the captain of one of the ships near us that night said the stars were so extraordinarily bright near the horizon that he was deceived into thinking that they were ships' lights. 
He did not remember seeing such a night before. Those who were afloat will all agree with that statement. We were often deceived into thinking they were lights of a ship. And next, the cold air. Here again was something quite new to us. There was not a breath of wind to blow keenly round us as we stood in the boat, and because of its continued persistence to make us feel cold. It was just a keen, bitter, icy, motionless cold that came from nowhere, and yet was there all the time. The stillness of it, if one can imagine cold being motionless and still, was what seemed new and strange. And these, the sky and the air, were overhead, and below was the sea. Here again something uncommon. The surface was like a lake of oil, heaving gently up and down with a quiet motion that rocked our boat dreamily to and fro. We did not need to keep her head to the swell. Often I watched her lying broadside on to the tide, and with a boat loaded as we were, this would have been impossible with anything like a swell. The sea slipped away smoothly under the boat, and I think we never heard it lapping on the sides, so oily in appearance was the water. So when one of the stokers said he had been to sea for twenty-six years and never yet seen such a calm night, we accepted it as true without comment. Just as expressive was the remark of another, It reminds me of a bloomin' picnic. It was quite true. It did. A picnic on a lake, or a quiet inland river like the Cam, or a backwater on the Thames. And so in these conditions of sky and air and sea, we gazed broadside on the Titanic from a short distance. She was absolutely still. Indeed, from the first it seemed as if the blow from the iceberg had taken all the courage out of her, and she had just come quietly to rest, and was settling down without an effort to save herself, without a murmur of protest against such a foul blow. For the sea could not rock her, the wind was not there to howl noisily round the decks, and make the ropes hum. From the first, what must have impressed all as they watched was the sense of stillness about her, and the slow, insensible way she sank lower and lower in the sea, like a stricken animal. The mere bulk alone of the ship, viewed from the sea below, was an awe-inspiring sight. Imagine a ship nearly a sixth of a mile long, seventy-five feet high to the top decks, with four enormous funnels above the decks, and masts again high above the funnels, with her hundreds of portholes, all her saloons and other rooms brilliant with light, and all round her little boats filled with those who, until a few hours before, had trod her decks and read in her libraries and listened to the music of her band in happy content and who were now looking up in amazement at the enormous mass above them and rowing away from her because she was sinking. I had often wanted to see her from some distance away, and only a few hours before, in conversation at lunch with a fellow passenger, had registered a vow to get a proper view of her lines and dimensions when we landed at New York to stand some distance away to take in a full view of her beautiful proportions, which the narrow approach to the dock at Southampton made impossible. Little did I think that the opportunity was to be found so quickly and so dramatically. The background, too, was a different one from what I had planned for her. The black outline of her profile against the sky was bordered all round by stars studded in the sky and all her funnels and masts were picked out in the same way. Her bulk was seen where the stars were blotted out. And one other thing was different from expectation, the thing that ripped away from us instantly as we saw it, all sense of the beauty of the night, the beauty of the ship's lines, and the beauty of her lights. And all these taken in themselves were intensely beautiful. That thing was the awful angle made by the level of the sea with the rows of porthole lights along her side in dotted lines, row above row. The sea level and the rows of lights should have been parallel, should never have met, and now they met at an angle inside the black hull of the ship. There was nothing else to indicate she was injured. 
nothing but this apparent violation of a simple geometrical law that parallel lines should never meet even if produced ever so far both ways but it meant the titanic had sunk by the head until the lowest portholes in the bows were under the sea and the portholes in the stern were lifted above the normal height we rode away from her in the quietness of the night hoping and praying with all our hearts that she would sink no more and the day would find her still in the same position as she was then the crew however did not think so it has been said frequently that the officers and crew felt assured that she would remain afloat even after they knew the extent of the damage some of them may have done so and perhaps from their scientific knowledge of her construction with more reason at the time than those who said she would sink but at any rate the stokers in our boat had no such illusion one of them i think he was the same man that cut us free from the pulley ropes told us how he was at work in the stoke hole and in anticipation of going off duty in quarter of an hour thus confirming the time of the collision as eleven forty five had near him a pan of soup keeping hot on some part of the machinery suddenly the whole side of the compartment came in and the water rushed him off his feet picking himself up he sprang for the compartment doorway and was just through the aperture when the watertight door came down behind him like a knife as he said they worked them from the bridge he had gone up on deck but was ordered down again at once, and with others was told to draw the fires from under the boiler, which they did, and were then at liberty to come on deck again. It seems that this particular knot of stokers must have known almost as soon as any one of the extent of injury. He added mournfully, I could do with that hot soup now. And indeed he could. He was clad at the time of the collision, he said, in trousers and singlet, both very thin on account of the intense heat in the stoke hole, and although he had added a short jacket later, his teeth were chattering with the cold. He found a place to lie down underneath the tiller on the little platform where our captain stood, and there he lay all night with a coat belonging to another stoker thrown over him, and I think he must have been almost unconscious. A lady next to him, who was warmly clad with several coats tried to insist on his having one of hers a fur-lined one thrown over him but he absolutely refused while some of the women were insufficiently clad and so the coat was given to an irish girl with pretty auburn hair standing near leaning against the gunwale with an outside berth and so more exposed to the cold air this same lady was able to distribute more of her wraps to the passengers a rug to one a fur boa to another and she has related the amusement that at the moment of climbing up the carpathia's side those to whom these articles had been lent offered them all back to her but as like the rest of us she was encumbered with a life belt she had to say she would receive them back at the end of the climb i had not seen my dressing gown since i dropped into the boat but some time in the night a steerage passenger found it on the floor and put it on it is not easy at this time to call to mind who were in the boat because in the night it was not possible to see more than a few feet away and when dawn came we had eyes only for the rescue ship and the icebergs but so far as my memory serves the list was as follows no first-class passengers three women one baby two men from the second cabin and the other passengers steerage mostly women a total of about thirty-five passengers the rest about twenty-five and possibly more were crew and stokers near to me all night was a group of three swedish girls warmly clad standing close together to keep warm and very silent indeed there was very little talking at any time one conversation took place that is i think worth repeating one more proof that the world after all is a small place the ten months old baby which was handed down at the last moment was received by a lady next to me the same who shared her wraps and coats the mother had found a place in the middle and was too tightly packed to come through to the child 
and so it slept contentedly for about an hour in the, a stranger's arms. It then began to cry, and the temporary nurse said, "'Will you feel down and see if the baby's feet are out of the blanket?' I don't know much about babies, but I think their feet must be kept warm. Wriggling down as well as I could, I found its toes exposed to the air and wrapped them well up, when it ceased crying at once. It was evidently a successful diagnosis. Having recognized the lady by her voice, it was much too dark to see faces. As one of my vis a vis at the purser's table, I said, "'Surely you are Miss... Um, yes,' she replied. "'And who must be Mr. Beasley? "'How curious we should find ourselves in the same boat.' "'Remembering that she had joined the boat at Queenstown, I said, "'Do you know Clonmel? "'A letter from a great friend of mine who is staying there at... "'Giving the address. "'Came aboard at Queenstown. "'Yes, it is my home, and I was dining at... Just before I came away, it seemed that she knew my friend, too, and we agreed that, of all places in the world to recognize mutual friends, a crowded lifeboat afloat in mid-ocean at 2 a.m., 1,200 miles from our destination, was one of the most unexpected. And all the time, as we watched, the Titanic sank lower and lower by the head, and the angle became wider and wider, as the stern porthole lights lifted and the bow lights sank and it was evident she was not to stay afloat much longer the captain stoker now told the oarsmen to row away as hard as they could two reasons seemed to make this a wise decision one that as she sank she would create such a wave of suction that boats if not sucked under by being too near would be in danger of being swamped by the wave her sinking would create and we all knew our boat was in no condition to ride big waves, crowded as it was, and manned with untrained oarsmen. The second was that an explosion might result from the water getting to the boilers, and debris might fall within a wide radius, and yet, as it turned out, neither of these things happened. At about 2.15 a.m., I think we were any distance from a mile to two miles away, it is difficult for a landsman to calculate distance at sea, but we had been afloat an hour and a half. The boat was heavily loaded, the oarsmen unskilled, and our course erratic, following now one light and now another, sometimes a star and sometimes a light from a port light boat, which had turned away from the Titanic in the opposite direction, and lay almost on our horizon, so we could not have gone very far away. About this time, the water had crept up almost to her side light and the captain's bridge, and it seemed a question only of minutes before she sank. The oarsmen lay on their oars, and all in the lifeboat were motionless as we watched her in absolute silence, save some who would not look and buried their heads on each other's shoulders. The lights still shone with the same brilliance, but not so many of them. Many were now below the surface. I have often wondered since whether they continued to light up the cabins when the portholes were under water. They may have done so. And then, as we gazed awestruck, she tilted slowly up, revolving apparently about a center of gravity just astern of amidships, until she attained a vertically upright position. And there she remained, motionless. As she swung up, her lights, which had shone without a flicker all night, went out suddenly, came on again for a single flash, then went out altogether. And as they did so, there came a noise which many people, wrongly, I think, have described as an explosion. It has always seemed to me that it was nothing but the engines and machinery coming loose from their bolts and bearings, and falling through the compartments, smashing everything in their way. It was partly a roar, partly a groan, partly a rattle, and partly a smash, and it was not a sudden roar as an explosion would be. It went on successively for some seconds, possibly fifteen to twenty, as the heavy machinery dropped down to the bottom, now the bows, of the ship. I suppose 
It fell through the end and sank first, before the ship. But it was a noise no one had heard before, and no one wishes to hear again. It was stupefying, stupendous, as it came to us along the water. It was as if all the heavy things one could think of had been thrown downstairs from the top of a house, smashing each other and the stairs and everything in the way. Several apparently authentic accounts have been given in which definite stories of explosions have been related, in some cases even with the wreckage blown up and the ship broken in two. But I think such accounts will not stand close analysis. In the first place, the fires had been withdrawn and the steam allowed to escape some time before she sank, and the possibility of explosion from this cause seems very remote. Then, as just related, the noise was not sudden and definite, but prolonged, more like the roll and crash of thunder. The probability of the noise being caused by engines falling down will be seen by referring to Figure 2, page 116, where the engines are placed in compartments 3, 4, and 5. As the Titanic tilted up, they would almost certainly fall loose from their bed and plunge down through the other compartments. No phenomenon like that pictured in some American and English papers occurred, that of the ship breaking in two, and the two ends being raised above the surface. I saw these drawings in preparation on board the Carpathia, and said at the time that they bore no resemblance to what actually happened. When the noise was over, the Titanic was still upright like a column. We could see her now only as the stern and some 150 feet of her stood outlined against the star-specked sky, looming black in the darkness, and in this position she continued for some minutes, I think as much as five minutes, but it may have been less. Then, first sinking back a little at the stern, I thought, she slid slowly forwards through the water and dived slantingly down. The sea closed over her, and we had seen the last of the beautiful ship on which we had embarked four days before at Southampton. And in place of the ship on which all our interest had been concentrated for so long, and towards which we looked most of the time, because it was still the only object on the sea which was a fixed point to us, in place of the Titanic, we had the level sea now stretching in an unbroken expanse to the horizon, heaving gently, just as before, with no indication on the surface that the waves had just closed over the most wonderful vessel ever built by man's hand. The stars looked down just the same, and the air was just as bitterly cold. There seemed a great sense of loneliness when we were left on the sea, in a small boat without the Titanic. Not that we were uncomfortable, except for the cold, nor in danger. We did not think we were either. But the Titanic was no longer there. We waited head-on for the wave which we thought might come, the wave we had heard so much of from the crew, and which they said had been known to travel for miles and it never came. But although the Titanic left us no such legacy of a wave as she went to the bottom, she left us something we would willingly forget forever, something which is well not to let the imagination dwell on, the cries of many hundreds of our fellow passengers struggling in the ice-cold water. I would willingly omit any further mention of this part of the disaster from this book, but for two reasons it is not possible. First, that as a matter of history it should be put on record. And secondly, that these cries were not only an appeal for help in the awful conditions of danger in which the drowning found themselves, an appeal that could never be answered, but an appeal to the whole world to make such conditions of danger and hopelessness impossible ever again. A cry that called to the heavens for the very injustice of its own existence, a cry that clamored for its own destruction. We were utterly surprised to hear this cry go up as the waves closed over the Titanic. 
We had heard no sound of any kind from her since we left her side, and as mentioned before, we did not know how many boats she had, or how many rafts. The crew may have known, but they probably did not, and if they did, they never told the passengers. We should not have been surprised to know all were safe on some life-saving device so that unprepared as we were for such a thing the cries of the drowning floating across the quiet sea filled us with stupefaction we longed to return and rescue at least some of the drowning but we knew it was impossible the boat was filled to standing room and to return would mean the swamping of us all and so the captain stoker told his crew to row away from the cries we tried to sing to keep all from thinking of them, but there was no heart for singing in the boat at that time. The cries, which were loud and numerous at first, died away gradually, one by one. But the night was clear, frosty, and still, the water smooth, and the sounds must have carried on its level surface free from any obstruction for miles, certainly much farther from the ship than we were situated. I think the last of them must have been heard nearly forty minutes after the Titanic sank. Life belts would keep the survivors afloat for hours, but the cold water was what stopped the cries. There must have come to all those safe in the lifeboats, scattered round the drowning at various distances, a deep resolve that, if anything could be done by them in the future to prevent the repetition of such sounds, they would do it at whatever cost of time or other things. And not only to them are those cries an imperative call, but to every man and woman who has known of them. It is not possible that ever again can such conditions exist. But it is a duty imperative on one and all to see that they do not. Think of it. A few more boats, a few more planks of wood, nailed together in a particular way at a trifling cost and all those men and women whom the world can so ill afford to lose would be with us to-day there would be no mourning in thousands of homes which now are desolate and these words need not have been written